You're listening to Trek FM. Welcome to From There to Here, Trek FM's 50th anniversary Star Trek rewatch. We're going through all 729 episodes of Star Trek from Enterprise to Star Trek Beyond and everything in between. I am Zach Moore and today I'm joined by Mr. Lee Hutchison. I don't know why I put the Mr. there. It seems a bit too formal. <laughs> well, I'm Mr. Zach Moore as well. So Lee and I, Lee and I are back. We got another block together. You know, if you listen to our last block, you probably uh, heard some uh, some negativity towards Star Trek Voyager. But I'm happy to say uh, this block, we have, we have some more positive things to say about Voyager, don't we, Lee? Yes, we do. I'm quite excited about this block. It seems pretty exciting, it, but we are starting it off on a bit of a bum note as far as I'm concerned, but it can only get better over the next four days. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So so we're talking about uh, Frangy Love Songs from Deep Space Nine and Real Life from Voyager. Uh, so let's start with uh, Frangy Love Songs. In this episode, Quark discovers that his mother and Grand Negus Zek have fallen in love with each other. So yeah, that's that's basically the plot of this episode. I, I love the sigh after that description. <laughs> Fringy episodes are kind of infamous on D Space Nine. Lee, what, what's your what's your take on them? I think that when they're good, they're good, and when they're bad, they're bad. Uh, the Magnificent Ferengi is one of my favorite Star Trek Deep Space Nine episodes, period. I always felt that the acting within it was good, the caliber of actors was fantastic, but it was just sometimes the writing and the lack of imagination would let it down that they just seem so small and uninteresting quite a lot of the time. And unfortunately, this episode is just one that, you know, it's not bad, it's not offensive, it's just, yeah, it's, yeah okay, fair enough. Yeah, it's not it's not profit and lace, uh, but it's not <laughs> quite you know rules of acquisition or something, right? There, there, there's a wide spectrum of freeing episodes, and you're right, this one's just kind of meh. I mean, there's something to be said for like it, it's an annoying trope in these uh, shows where, or any show really, when like you have somebody's parent, and then you have like another character, and then you get later in the seasons, and you're like, you know what? Let's just let's start hooking up these these auxiliary characters together, right? Because you had Ishka established and you had Zek established, obviously, and they're ringing and they're older. But I guess they decided, like, oh yeah, wouldn't it be fun to like couple them up and pair them off? And I don't, I don't know, it, pairing up every single character like that sometimes gets annoying to me. It sometimes makes the world seem so small as well that we've got this like huge Ferengi empire and somehow these two characters that we both know end up together it just makes it just a bit too small sometimes that the odds of it happening are so thin that everyone knows everyone and everyone's involved in everyone's business and it it just makes it feel slightly incestuous in a way um i just wish there was a bit more breathing room i mean i have no problem that they are together i'm just don't really care to be honest you know it's good to see old people in relationships i guess in star trek (laughs) not just the young sexy characters um so there's that i guess universe shrinking right exactly and uh you know but hey it's great to see uh jeffrey combs brunt again right it's good I, you know i'd love to open my closet one day when i'm getting my pants and socks out and find jeffrey combs <laughs> in my closet that would be quite a quite a surreal and exciting start to my day brunt fca uh i i do i do prefer him as way yoon it's my favorite you know with jeffrey combs performance but brunt would probably be number two as far as Jeffrey Combs, uh, well, I don't know. Shrant's pretty good too. But Jeffrey Combs, as we know on this network, he's everywhere, and he's yeah. great in this episode as always. Um, I mean, he j- it's just that Brunt's, you know, he's got his funny moments and characters, but he, especially compared to say like Quark and Rom, he kind of falls under the radar. He doesn't stand out as much as the other characters. So, um, yeah, it's always good to have Jeffrey Combs playing a role, but it's not one of the more memorable Jeffrey Combs turns. So then, yeah, there is a whole other subplot here we haven't talked about is uh, rom and lita's uh engagement and breaking off and and i don't know that, that was that, they're kind of a weird couple aren't they rom, yeah. rom and lita right and i guess that's the thing like i like it that you know it's almost that beauty and the beast style relationship that you've got this most beautiful character in lita and she's rom you know she's she loves this bomb on his head alien it you know it gives us all hope or false hope you know depending on what side of the aisle you fall down on but this is a plot line that's it's pretty boring it's you know eh, whatever well and then you know chief o'brien kind of inadvertently 
kick this whole thing off because Rom starts showing up and he's so easygoing. He's wearing the big oversized Bajoran earring, which is kind of funny to see on a fringing ear. And O'Brien's like, so what uh, What kind of fringing thing is she doing for you? He's like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> and then, like sets off the whole plot. Is that, was that um, Barney Rubble or was that meant to be Rom? <laughs> well, I, I think he might have borrowed, I think uh, Max uh, wrote and check might have borrowed some from, uh, from Barney. I pro- he probably did, yeah. The one thing I did take away from Ferengi love songs that I never noticed before on the rewatch was like there's some foreshadowing to the penultimate episode of Deep Space Nine that we see um, Grand Nega Zek gets memory recall problems and he calls Quark Rom all the time and we see that kind of pop up again in later episodes when he's telling Quark when he's meant to be telling Rom that he's going to become the next Grand Nega. So there's some foreshadowing for two two and a half seasons time. So That's there's true. that. And I did, I did find it funny at the end where he's like, I couldn't have done it without you, Rom. He's like, ah, I've lost my memory, but not my sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> so Wallace Shawn is great. I mean, the actors really do salvage these what could have been bad for any episodes. Uh, these performances, they're just always fun to watch, you know, because they go all Definitely. in. Armin Shimmerman, they just sell it. They just, you know what, this is what we're doing this week, and I'm, I'm going for it all in. And, you know, yeah. it's, it's fun it's to just, watch. It's just a waste of comedy talent sometimes that all these folk are brilliant at doing the comedy, but the writing just doesn't seem to click, or there's just something that just isn't working. But you watch it enough times, and you get enough moments here and there, a bit of a character trait. There's something in it, but the episode's just kind of, this one particularly, just it's just completely uninteresting. Right, and Ishka is actually recast from last time we saw her. Um, you know, she's under so much makeup; it doesn't really matter. <laughs> you know, to yeah. be fair, right? But Deep Space Nine it does have an interesting uh, trend of recasting these characters, like uh, Ducat's daughter Zial. Yes, yeah, you know, yeah. Just, just if there's if there's a, a a character under a lot of makeup, you know, they're like, oh, let's just let's you know, it doesn't matter. We can switch out the actor; it's no big deal. But you know, there's all kinds of behind the scenes reasons they do stuff like that. But anyway, worth noting. And uh, Ishka's always a fun character. So, anyway, that's, I think that's about all we have to say about Fringy Love Songs. Uh, Lee, let's go ahead and move on to real life. In this Voyager episode, the Doctor learns a few real life lessons with the holographic, quote, family he created. Meanwhile, Voyager investigates massive subspace distortions. So, once again, Voyager, right? Uh, spatial anomaly, holodeck stuff going on. What are your thoughts? Well, I did the drinking game and had a shot when they ended up on the holodeck and had a shot when they found a spatial anomaly, so I was quite drunk while watching this episode. But um, no, I really like real life. It's one of my favourite Voyager episodes from season three, even though the plot with the nebula, whatever that's all about, you know, it's totally uninteresting, but it doesn't detract from how enjoyable the subplot with the Doctor is. It really is quite heartbreaking. I think the performances in both kind of the families at the beginning where you see them as this like i love lucy we love you kenneth Uh, all that stuff is is so (laughs) fantastic and then you've got um the family when they become a real life family in a way it's just there's so many wonderful performances and even i find myself feeling like i'm in the doctor's shoes when he goes into that house and the klingon music's playing and i'm like i find myself going mad watching the episode like can someone just turn down that goddamn music it's it's so good and it's such a great insight into the doctor and i really love the ending it, it, it's so powerful and i've probably seen this episode so many times and that ending still makes my heart break a little bit each time yeah i thought you know th- this is a good episode it uh yeah, your, your silly kind of sci-fi, you know, spatial anomaly plot doesn't go anywhere or really mean anything. It just kind of serves the A plot of, of the Doctor because he's reacting to everyone's reactions to this. Tom's kind of a thrill seeker, and that kind of sets off the Doctor because, you know, his his son and daughter are, are, are experimenting with things. And, man, you know, everybody has talked about uh, how dangerous Parisi Squares is uh, as far uh, in, in Star Trek uh, over the years, and, and I guess so. I guess it really is dangerous because yeah. his, what, 12-year-old daughter hit her head on the corner and she, she's going to die? I mean, that's pretty know, extreme, right? Don't they wear helmets like, or something? Right? Yeah, it was always one of those games that you always heard about. It almost became that kind of, oh, they've mentioned it, but you never get to see it. And to see, like, everyone's always, oh, it's such a dangerous game. And you, as a viewer, you're like, well, is it? I don't know. what. It, how can it be that dangerous? And the fact that even though it's a holodeck simulation, the fact that we get to see the consequences of it, adds a bit to this star trek thread that's run through so many series and episodes Mm -hmm. yeah i mean i don't know it's one of those things where if we ultimately did see it it'd probably be disappointing so it's probably for the best it just remains this this never to be seen thing always referenced um it's probably like tennis or something like that (laughs) with like fluorescent balls (laughs) exactly future tennis um (laughs) i I will say this about this episode it 
uh, what are the stakes really? I mean, I mean, yes, I think when you're watching it, you're like, yeah, you get caught up in the whole emotion of the doctor, but couldn't he just like reset the program? I mean, is that really, I mean, I give Voyager credit for not being like, oh, the, the spatial anomaly has fused the holodeck and now we, we can't reset the program or it all be a right. You know, there was some silly trope like that as they often As if do. Voyager would do that, Zach, yeah. don't be silly. <laughs> Uh, so, so, uh, so at least I wasn't like, oh, the, the, it's been fused. We can't turn it off. But right. Couldn't he just always have reset the program? But I guess, uh, you know, as Tom tells him at the end, what's the whole point? You know, you, you started this program to learn about real life. If you're just going to reset it, then you've learned nothing. Right. I guess that's yeah. the moral of the story. You can't reset real life. Yeah. Take, take note, Voyager writing room. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's very fascinating. That kind of aspect that why doesn't he reset it? And it, I think that is the little motto of the case that the real life decision is to, to follow it through that life, the painful moments we've all experienced. We, I'm sure we've all suffered bereavement that are listening to this podcast and it defines you. It really adds to you. It, it Part makes your worldview somewhat change that even though I you know we never hear from it again or it's touched upon again I like to believe in my head that the doctor has carried on this you know feeling of what it was like to lose someone and has taken that into how he applies medical care and the standards he'd expect that he's a doctor that goes ho- that switches off at night now he knows what it's like to have some to care for someone and you know what kind of care you would expect if you were in that position so I think it's a kind of humbling experience and one that I think hopefully defined his care in the future yeah and it generates empathy that he might not have otherwise had before having gone through a loss like this so yeah because ultimately he's only got three years worth of life experience that you know how would he know what it's like to deal with perhaps a loss um, a bereavement something like that and it can really you know those experiences are still kind of very new to him and while he has all this medical experience he doesn't often have the the real life knowledge like the relationships the friendships and now the family experiences and that's really added to his um you know his being i think yeah yeah definitely what did you think of his name kenneth i think out of all the doctor's names he got he gets <laughs> he got listen to me he gets over the years uh i i think i like that one the best <laughs> Uh, yeah i think that one's a pretty good one um yeah kenneth what's i always just think of like i imagine they had like rem or something playing on the (laughs) um in the what's called the office that day and they did and yeah what's the frequency kenneth yeah we'll go with that one (laughs) although uh, uh, there was um balana right you think she was out of place telling the doctor your your family's bs we need to reset it or do you think that was a fair fair thing for her to do it's true to her character that if you look at that character i'm I'm, even i was finding it insufferable to sit through that family and you can imagine with balana's short temper listening to someone go we love you kenneth kenneth is so great dad can i do this with you tonight and it's it's so sick sweet it's like having the biggest gobstopper in the world in your mouth that i'm you know i guess it would probably be what we'd all like to think we'd act like but balana torres is probably what we would act like in that situation <laughs> that's a good point that's a good point <laughs> well yeah I, you know and i've said many times I, the doctor is my favorite voyager character there's so much just just rich so much rich material to be mined there this is just another another example of that yes they go back to the holodeck again but i mean he's a hologram so i feel like whenever I mean, Voyager does overuse the holodeck. Let's be real. But whenever you're dealing with a doctor, it's it's fine because he's a hologram. So that 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 makes it work for me. Yeah, it's, it's used as a lesson here, not necessarily as like the plot story. That yeah, it's based on the holodeck, but like the emotions are real. They're not just there pretending they're an Irish settlers or playing pool. It's actually being used to further the story, further someone's development, and that's what it was always best at in Next Generation. I think. Agreed. Agreed. Well, Lee, uh, anything else to say, or are we, are we done with real life here? No, I, I think I'm done there. Yeah, I'm going to go play some Precy Squares instead. <laughs> well, be careful, man. Wear a helmet or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Lee. Well, people want to find you on the internet. Where can they find you? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Lee underscore Nostromo, and you can find me in the Babel Conference, and you can find me on my own podcast, The Senate Floor, where I talk about geek culture and film and everything in between. As for me, you can find me here every week on Standard Orbit, our original series podcast on Trek FM. For me personally, I'm on Twitter at MoronZach, that's M-O-O-R-E-O-N-Z-A-C-H, and I'm also the host of my own podcast, Always Hold On to Smallville, where we talk about each and every episode of that young Superman show. We're on Twitter at Always Smallville with one S. And Lee and I will be back tomorrow talking Soldiers of the Empire from Deep Space Nine and Distant Origin from Voyager. Voyager.